Under the growing pressure of the TWA decision, Hughes again sought a retreat from his problems. He flew to the Bahamas and spent his time isolated in a darkened hotel suite. He planned on making huge real estate investments, and ex-CIA man Bob Mayhew was brought in to aid in these transactions. Sometime in 1960, uh, during a period wherein for some previous years, I had been doing work for the CIA. I was approached by my project officer who asked me if in connection with a planned invasion in Cuba. Mayhew had been freelancing for Hughes for some time, mainly spying on ex-girlfriends and recruiting naive starlets. Before leaving the Bahamas, Hughes telephoned Mayhew and asked him to play a much more important role in the Empire. He explained to me that uh, he did not want to make any public appearances in the future, that he wanted me to become his alter ego. He wanted me to convince the world that when they spoke to me, they in reality were speaking to Howard Hughes. Under the direction of Bob Mayhew, Hughes was taken by stretcher into a service entrance of the Desert Inn whereupon he and his aides settled into suites on the penthouse floor. Hughes would remain there in almost constant isolation for the next four years. He soon overstayed his welcome as Desert Inn owners sought to regain control of their profitable high roller suites. Came a, a time later where they had given an instruction to the security guards that if Hughes was not vacated in 48 hours that they bodily come up to the ninth floor and kick him out of the hotel. They were very unhappy when Hughes didn't want to leave, so it ended up that we started negotiations and finally made the deal in March to acquire the hotel. Now, in other words, he bought the hotel because he needed a place to sleep. During negotiations for the Desert Inn, Hughes' tax attorneys informed him that casino receipts qualified as active income. This effectively solved his tax dilemma. He was in ecstasy. He called me and he said, imagine this is money from heaven. Are there any more of these joints available? And so after that, we started to buy more hotels. He got excited about it and, and had all this cash laying around, so to speak. About that time, he made up his mind that he wanted to be the biggest in the gaming business. Giancana had reason to be confident in his relationship with the United States government. The CIA had invited him to take part in a bizarre plot to murder Fidel Castro. A planned invasion in Cuba. I would contact a Mr. John Roselli. We started having meetings in uh, Miami. During one of those meetings in Miami, I was introduced to a Mr. Sam Gold, who subsequently uh, turned out to be uh, Mr. Giancana. The Mafia were the Fall Guys. If the operation was discovered, they, not the government, would take the blame. The prize, the return of their Cuban casinos. The idea was put to Johnny Rosselli, Giancana's man in Hollywood, by a CIA contact. He thought I was kidding at first. Then he became stupefied. And after a few more drinks, he knew I was telling the truth. At a meeting in Miami, Rosselli and his boss, Sam Giancana, agreed to kill Castro. I became convinced very early on that both Rosselli and Giancana we're doing this as good Americans. Many racketeers now smoldered with hatred for the Kennedys. Giancana himself, his union friend Jimmy Hoffa, 
his co-conspirator in the Castro plot, Santo Traficante, all had been targeted by Bobby Kennedy for prosecution. But three quick shots shattered this day, November 22nd, 1963. Sam Giancana told my father that we took care of Kennedy together, that elements of the CIA, along with members of the mob, uh, joined together to assassinate the President of the United States. That they each had equal reason uh, to make sure that Kennedy did no longer uh, remain in office. They picked Las Vegas, Nevada. Santo Jr. had enjoyed running the Cuban casinos, but was hesitant to invest in an operation within the United States. I think really by the time Traficante finally realized, hey, maybe I should get into Vegas, it might have been too late. At the time, he felt it would be wiser to build another casino empire somewhere in the Caribbean over the next few years, especially through the mid-60s, you see him sending emissaries to Ecuador, to the Bahamas, to the Virgin Islands, to Venezuela, all throughout Central, South America, and the Caribbean to open up casino operations there. None of them ever really panned out the way he wanted it to. It was a very, very tough time for me. Um, here I had been in 1957 uh, in the Bahamas. Uh, he had appointed me as his alter ego. I frankly did not know that Howard Hughes would really understand what alter ego means, but I checked him out on it, and much to my amazement, he did know. He told me that he wanted me to come up with a plan whereby when I spoke, the whole world would know that it is Howard Hughes speaking. He said, I want you, if I'm subpoenaed for a regulatory body, congressional committee, or in a lawsuit, whatever it is, I want you to be in a position to be able to convince them that you are me and that you can answer the questions for me. And that's what we did. And that's what we did. And that's what we did. 